Scott Peterson has finally spoken out for the first time in 20 years. And oh yeah, we're talking about it in today's video. Hello, Silver Squad, and welcome back to the... I guess the pillows and headboard really is all you can see back there. And maybe the little table lamp and possibly a CPAP machine, but that's a whole other issue. <laughs> I hope you all are doing well. My name is Paul. Welcome to the channel if you're new. And obviously it's a, it's a fraud. The sofa's not back there. I, I'm not at home right now, but I have been uh, watching the Scott Peterson docu-series that came out on the 20th. It's on Peacock. You already know, y'all, Peacock alone literally is probably like, we could do a retirement plan off this reporting live sofa dude because he signs up for a free trial at least 10 times a year and pays for whatever a week or however it works and then cancels and then comes back right please you know take my money on this I, I i will do it so you don't have to watch it or give them money more money but i had to see it okay now i'm gonna say this it's called face to face scott peterson so before we even get into the review of it, it's very much, if you watch the Lacey Peterson Netflix docuseries, it's a, so much information crosses over on it, y'all. I mean, literally, I was like watching like, yeah, we just learned this, we just learned this, we just learned this, but obviously Scott speaks out in this and you hear like more from his side of the family in this one, so there's that. Now, the way I do these videos, if you are new here, is I literally sit and watch them with my phone and make notes and use these as talking points and then come here to the Sova Squad go over it. I'll read the comments. 100% we're going to be doing a live chat on the podcast channel for this and then probably a second one to do a comment read on it because I know they're going to be good, okay? <laughs> they're going to be good. We did one on the Lacey Peterson docu, docu series and it was, it's, I absolutely love interacting with y'all and talking to y'all like that about these things like this that really get me going because listen to me, I was coming up off the damn, the real sofa out in the living room. Come me off of it over this, okay? At four in the morning, ready to put my hand to the screen. So, just know it, it I, I, I'm a little bit emotional over this one, okay? So, let me pull my notes up and we'll get into it. Now, one thing I'll say, and I put this in here somewhere, but I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. And I was talking to Sammy on the little Patreon chat, I think about this, where I kept coming back to this. Lacey was only 26 years old and with child gives me goosebumps right now depending on how old you are or whatnot i'm 40 i think i'll be 47 this year i'm old enough to kind of not know how old i am anymore <laughs> at 46 or 47 i'll be one of those this year anyways that's again a whole other subject however looking at these cases and whatnot and like learning as much as we have about her you know being revisiting Lacey, who she was what you know came of what her fate was and whatnot and then i just kept going over she was only 26 and at this stage of my life and i'm not trying to say this like in any way for somebody who's 26 I'm like what's he talking about but i'm like she was just a baby you know what i'm saying i know she was a young adult a young lady yeah i get all that she's a married kid i get that but just what i mean by that is there is so much more life to live. I look at the good, the bad, and the ugly that's happened in my life since that age. I can't imagine that being it, right? And not even like, it wasn't like that was just some natural, like, okay, that was just her time. It was like it was stolen from her, let alone the life ahead of Connor. It absolutely just, it, it's so sad and so tragic. So I just wanted to bring that up. I know I made a note in here, but I just want to say it because it's really what I took from this. Okay, so episode one, there's three episodes in it. The first one is, where is Lacey Peterson? Now I'm going to say this, like I said, a lot of this is repetitive from the Netflix docuseries. Series, but it is what it is. Okay, so it opens up with Scott's sister-in-law looking at their wedding pictures and she says he was wrongfully convicted. She says that he hasn't spoken out in 20 and year, 21 years until today. Then it cuts to Scott. He's on the prison phone. He's talking to like the filmmaker or whatever. Uh, and he says he regrets not testifying. We'll get more to that later. He has a chance to now tell the truth and hopes people accept it because he didn't kill his family. Oh, Okay, now, pause right there. Okay, I'm gonna try and remain neutral throughout this, but if you follow me, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and say my bias. I think he's guilty. I think he did it. I can appreciate the deductive reasoning that his family and that side has come to. I get it. Watching this, I was like, I can see, especially if you had, you know, it's your family member. I can see that. From my vantage point, I'm not related. I don't know these people. 
I wasn't in the case. I wasn't in the investigation, any of that stuff. So I can't say, I say either way. So that's why I say it's my bias, but I do feel that way. And so I like to go into some of these things, just being very upfront about that, because I do feel like the filmmaker in this had a bias, which was, you know, you'll kind of see as we go. And it's probably why I would never actually make like a official film like that or whatever, right? Because I'm like, oh, I would get a bias too. You know, I mean, I just would try and go into it with open mind because watching this, I'm like, seriously, seriously, Jane is his sister her in law and I will get what she's very prominent in this and she has literally spent her last 20 years fighting for his freedom she's gotten her law degree everything and you're just watching this like how what you know like this guy has literally just swindled everyone around him it blows my mind okay so let's keep going i wrote then we see news coverage of the la innocence project taking on the case you know how the very beginning they do these like little overviews and clips and stuff like that now let's also be very very clear going forward because they even make this mistake throughout and i have two of my videos the la innocence project is not related to the innocent project innocence project that you are currently thinking of wow not the same people <laughs> okay not the same people not the same threshold of the bar being held to a certain degree. nope completely different people okay so just know that because when you start getting like why did they take this on why did they do this of course i don't know personally but just know this not it's not the innocence project okay so this is the theory that the van was burned with a mattress with blood stains found near the Peterson home might be connected. Now this, they just kind of quickly go into that and we'll get into that more when we get to episode three, but just know that that is at the center of the LA Innocence Project taking this on, this whole thing with the van, the burglary, all that. They go into that more and this is probably the most in depth that I have gotten information of why do people think this van in this situation? And so this, docuseries explains it if you have not like followed this case for 20 years and all that which i have not i remember it happening it has always been you know especially since i've started making content i keep up with it because it's you know one of those cases i remember this i remember it on tv it's like this oj those mega cases like that fatal vision like all that kind of stuff so Let's keep going. Okay, so it flashes to March 12th, a 20, 2024 hearing. I wrote, I've covered this before. It's about releasing evidence. And this is just that, the, the Innocence Project and them going up to bat for him and all that. Again, we'll get into that. Aphrodite Jones or Aphrodite Jones, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, says it's hard to figure out a sociopath. And amen, girl. Okay, that's one of the perplexities of these cases that we watch. And whether it's... Jody Arias, Chris Watts, Scott Peterson, Michael Peterson, these very complex people that are, I mean, they just got a lot going on. Okay, yeah, going on. And if you've worked with or been around or related or dated people that might fall into the category of sociopath or narcissist or any of these kind of personality traits, you know it what one person might think of that person is you're like that they're completely different over here behind closed doors and i have a feeling that that's a lot of what went into scott i think a lot of people got a lot of different versions of him but he also had the forward facing scott that everybody got let's keep going okay so then i wrote shireen anderson now this is the filmmaker the documentary filmmaker uh, an investigative journalist she speaks and says 2013 she started investigating the case and initially thought he was guilty she says it's a circumstantial case circumstantial evidence case a lot of people will come back to this uh, she reached out to scott and heard from his sister-in-law janie peterson who i told you about we see them driving around we then see shireen and scott talk okay so this is the big moment right she says you were convicted of a horrible crime why would anyone want to hear your side of the story why would they care scott says he has a chance to show the truth and if people accept it maybe that would take some of the hurt off his family he says don't trust me look at the evidence now just stop right there okay here's my thought process on that Scott has had 20, 21 years, whatever it is, to sit and mull over every bit of evidence, every bit of testimony, every bit of discovery. He has been able to come up with excuses for everything. He's been able to line a story up. That's all he, his life stopped at that moment when he got arrested. And he's been able to go back and create narratives for everything. He says, look at the evidence. Now I'll go ahead and say this right now. And one of the cops says in episode three, the investigators run the DNA test, 
give all give LA Innocence Project all the stuff they want to test. They're very confident that it will show. And I even you know questioned is LA Innocence Project trolling Scott to be like, okay, yeah, we want to help you, wink, wink. Now we're gonna prove that it was really you, and we're gonna just mark out any potential that could be anybody else. You see what I'm saying? And that's how I feel. I'm like, oh, go ahead and test it. Please test it. I will never get past, and I know it's like, well, it's circumstantial. We don't have this, we don't have that. I will never get past how much circumstantial evidence there was and the things that were going on during the time with his behavior. I get that cheating on your wife, your spouse, whatever, doesn't make you a murderer, but this was another level. This was another level. You know, we'll get to it. I mean, I, y'all, it's all I could do not just like sit here and just go off, okay? I'm sitting, y'all, I'm like pressed, okay? So I'm just trying to, phew. we're gonna go in the order that I wrote the notes. We're not gonna get a line. We're gonna go in the order. Let's keep going. Okay, so we're taken to Christmas Eve with the 911 calls over Lacey. Now this is like from her parents and stuff like that. And this is where I wrote, she was only 26. You know, I spoke to that. Lacey's mom, Sharon, speaks and talks about the last time talking, getting the phone call from Scott. And again, if you watch the recent docuseries, Series on Netflix. It's just very emotional when you hear families go back over their last moments or last things. And you, when you even apply that to yourself and think of whatever your situation is, it was that last phone call with my mom, the last one I had before blank happens. You know, you kind of put yourself into these situations. It's one of my interests in true crime is to look at seemingly just everyday people who get thrust into these horrible tragedies, not by choice, obviously, right? Like Lacey's family and whatnot. And the human capacity to overcome and to get up every day, put one foot in front of the other, it gives me goosebumps. The ability to do that, I find it very inspirational, uh, what the human mind and spirit is capable of in the dire circumstances like this of losing a child or a loved one in these circumstances. Okay, let's keep going. So Scott describes the anxiety and panic he had realizing she was missing. I wrote, mm-hmm. Side eye, okay? Side eye. Here's the thing. In fact, let's just read the next thing, okay, because the detective sums it up. We hear from the detective who was called in. He describes showing up and seeing all the people there. He says Scott was nonchalant. Another detective says Scott showed no signs of panic. The detective talks about, about a bunch of umbrellas in Scott's truck, how he was going to go store them at the shop. The detective sees rags in the washer. Scott says that he took them out of the washer so he could wash his clothes. The detective says this is odd. He says Scott's jacket that was in the truck wasn't wet because so Scott was saying his clothes were from fishing and nothing Scott said made sense. Now here's the thing. And you know, again, I'll go into this a little bit. Now Scott's going back because again, he's able to sit here and see what people say. Oh, I didn't act a certain way when I came in, you know, and it's like, and the detectives will say, yeah, so you have a eight month pregnant wife. Okay, you know, when they looked at Dr. Rogers, she wasn't, Lacey was not in a condition to be walking the dog or doing all this stuff, right? We'll get into that later. You go out fishing, okay? Nobody knows about this bow, that's a whole other thing. You come home, you leave her this ushy gushy message, you get home, she's not there. You haven't spoke to her all day. So you're going to take rags out of the thing, wash just your clothes, have pizza, have milk, go do this, go do that, then call. This is red flag number one, okay? And we talked about this in the live chat, I talked about it in the other videos. Now again, we're all different human beings. We all do different things differently and handle things differently. I get that, right? So I'm looking at through the bias of me, how I am. I can tell you my experience, even when I, I've been with people who clearly, you know, I wasn't with a woman who was pregnant kind of a thing, because that adds a whole other layer of where, where, where is she, you know? Number one, I wouldn't have gone fishing that day. It just, that wouldn't even happened. But put yourself in that. I'm like, okay, so I've been gone all day. I'll look at my ex, Matt. If I hadn't talked to him all day long, and then I came home, and he wasn't there, which again, everybody's situation is different, you know, whatever. And I call, and it's like, he's not there. Oh, you better believe I'm not going to be sitting having pizza and milk. Now, am I going to be talking about I, you know, am, out on a search party right then and there. But at that point, if there was someone that I knew that he could have been with or whatever, I would have, that's the first thing. Because I'm just like, well, where are you? Then, so let's put ourselves in their situation, but through my lens of that's how I react. And I'm like, my eight month, oh, my eight month pregnant wife, 
is gone, not there, I've walked home. You think I'm gonna be worried about taking my clothes off and washing them and having some pizza and milk? Absolutely not. But again, to each their own, everybody's different. It just doesn't, the math ain't math them. Okay, so, an attorney says you don't commit a violent act without getting your hands dirty. He says no defensive wound, no crime scene, etc. And this is very true. And this is something to be looked at because yes, it is true. We can get wrongful convictions from situations like this and it does need to be looked at. Now they would find a spot of blood on the comforter or something like that. They're like, well, maybe she scratched him when he was, you know, strangling her. They think it's a soft kill. So basically he did something that wasn't like, you know, knives and stuff like that or whatever. So... I can respect that, right? However, so many times when you look at some of these cases that explode like this with these different this, that, the other, and bet, 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 you know, and you the, how the cookie crumbles in such a way that it just, it's, you just don't exactly know. Casey Anthony, uh, Kathleen Peterson, Michael Peterson, that the staircase, two that come to my mind right away, you know, where it's just like, will we ever truly know factually what happened to Kaylee Anthony? No, technically no. Can we connect the dots? Yeah. Kathleen Peterson, will we ever truly know what happened on that staircase? No, there's really no way to tell. Only a couple of people know, you know, and maybe an owl, but for the most part, only a couple of people. So can we connect the dots? Yeah. This right here, Will we ever really know what happened? Because we don't, that's the other part to it, we don't. Can we kind of connect the dots? For the most part, yeah, let's keep going. So now we go back to Scott on the little prison call thing. He says that he heard a detective say, oh yeah, we know what's going on here when they searched his house. Scott says the detectives had already made their mind up about his guilt. Okay, now, so he's talking about when they're searching the house and like he said, they already made their mind up. And yes, we do see this often. Detectives in a lot of these cases, and especially this, they're very upfront of, hey, when we come into a scenario, male, female, whatever, we have to start from the inside and work our way out, right? They could never get past Scott. That's the whole clincher. You know, now them saying like, yeah, I know what happened here. I mean, again, you come in and you're seeing, okay, so you're, pregnant wife is gone but you're eating pizza and milk and seeing his demeanor of eh, okay, yeah okay yeah she's missing you know mm -mm, no absolutely not so then we switch the narrative to some like friends and family of scott's and whatnot and they talk about how awesome he was and again i'm sure it, people can be multiple things at one time right i'm sure people viewed a lot of people him as this like really super cool dude i mean you hear people talk about what he was like right this does not surprise me so we go back to scott and he's reminiscing about the little things that he loved about lacy and I mean, I'm sorry again, I don't know this man personally, but it feels hollow. It feels absolutely hollow. I don't buy it. I do not buy it whatsoever. Okay, so then the detectives talk about how comfortable Scott was when they brought him in for questioning. Scott says that he was trying to keep everything together. So, you know, the detectives are like, he was just like kicked back in the chair, being totally like whatever. And Scott's like, well, I wanted to keep up a facade. I wanted to keep everything together. And I'm like, no, that's, this is what I'm talking about. No. I got into a conversation with a friend about this, about, you know, expectations from the public that we, we seem to form over, you know, people that, you know, Chris Watts, Scott, Susan Smith, people getting, you know, Jody Arias, people going to the media and talking about, you know, whatever, uh, my loved ones lost, my kids are missing, and our first interpretation of that, and like society's expectations. And, you know, and then you get into the whole, you know, conversation of, well, there's these different expectations that people expect from a woman versus a man. You know, yes, you know, at a, what level, like, okay, well, before we know what's going on, we're expecting this from the man and this from the woman. But then when we find out what happens, well, then this is okay and that's okay. So the conversation that my friend and I had, yeah, you know, we were talking about what our expectations were and like how we would react or think we would react. You know, we kind of had the same thing where it was like, you know what, if I was like being thrust in front of a bunch of cameras and the situation was currently going on of where this person is, there would be a level of panic, but also almost like this like, okay, so like in my mind, I'm thinking like, I'd be like, what if they're like in the woods and the elements? What if somebody kidnapped them? What if this is going on? What if this? We need to be out here. Almost like that like ADD kind of like, you know, we have to go. If I'm on camera and all of a sudden they tell me, oh, by the way, we just found the body. That's when you're going to see me more be like, you know, like more of like an emotion 
gives me goosebumps. Like emotional breakdown type thing. So I could see people being like, well, why isn't he crying when they're missing? I'd be like, oh, trust me, I'm in like fight mode up here, right? Now again, if you look at society and whatnot, they have a completely different expectation of a female, right? Fair, unfair, whatever it is, what it is. You know, cause you can just see this and how people are, well, why didn't she do this? Why she didn't do that? If she's, you know, this is on the assumption that she didn't do something, right? So it just brings that into into conversation. That being said, so I, I I place that on whoever I'm watching subconsciously, but also knowing we're all different, right? However, okay, when I see a dude like Scott kick back in the chair, act in a certain way, like not, not like, okay, what do we need to do to find Lacey? She's pregnant. Uh, can we hurry this up so we can get back out there? That's not the vibe going on. In fact, he's putting deterrence for that because we're like, well, we need to do this. And he's like, well, I'm not doing that. I need a lawyer for that. That's what I'm talking about, right? So anyways, let's keep going. Now also in that, the detectives will say, they noticed that Scott referred to Lacey in the past tense a few times during that initial interview. Point noted, you know, we got it. So then they go into talking about the, the boat that he purchased in the timeline. So December 9th, he buys the boat. This was his maiden voyage with the boat and that was a last minute decision. But the detectives say he got a fishing license for the 23rd and the 24th. So he's saying that it's last minute, but then he got this fishing license, right, for two days. Now this is, you know, also we haven't applied the Amber timeline of, okay, towards the end of November, he's talking about, I lost my wife. And then just a little bit later, the plan to get rid of Lacey comes like right into play, right? So we'll get to that. Okay, so the cop says, why drive 90 miles to take the boat out? Other detectives say Scott's phone records match his story, and this is what I think Scott did. I think he mixed truth with fiction. I think that's why his story comes off as like, eh, because he told the truth on a lot of stuff. Yeah, we saw it. We got up. She was watching this Martha Stewart thing. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I went here. I went there. He did that. His phone records match. It makes sense, which gives you this plausible deniability like this, you know, reasonable doubt into the whole thing. All right, let's keep going. So the detective says the message Scott left Lacey that day. That's what I was talking about earlier. So when he calls up and he's like, I'm on my way home. The detective says it was over the top like it was meant for him to hear. Now, Scott said like meant for other people to hear it. Now, this is what Scott says about that. Scott says, that's how we talk. You know, we're a married couple. We're happy. We're in love. You know, I feel bad for the detectives if they don't have marriages like that. So you see how he's gaslighting the scenario. But again, this is one of those things where he can go through every last little bit of thing and make sure he has a canned answer for it. Why wouldn't I talk to her like that? Think of all the times in these situations where we see these phone calls like that, where it's so obvious. Hey, love bug, it's me, Smoochums. Hey, I haven't talked to you today. I've been calling you all day. Where are you? Think about, now I'm not trying to say that you would be mean to somebody, but the phone call probably be more like this. Hey, babe, what's going on? I'm trying to get a hold of you. Look, I need you to run down there and do that for me, okay? I'll be home in a little bit. Bye, call me. It's gonna be way more regular. You can still interject that, but there's a, just a different level. Now, mind you, hearing from people talk about Scott, how he was like a love bomber type person, he might be that type, you know, to be like, hey there, goo -gee, goo -gee, goo. <laughs> you know, that's like kind of like creepy and inappropriate or whatever, but that's whatever. Okay, so let's keep going. Let's see. The filmmaker asked Scott, why did you want to get uh, Ron a boat for Christmas, his father-in-law. And Scott basically comes up with a story about his own relationship with his grandfather. And so essentially he's like trying to recreate that with Connor and Lacey's dad, Lacey's, uh, you know, uh, Ron. And to create that, like, oh, they could have this and, you know, they could have this bond and this relationship of the boat and this, that, and the other. And I'm over here like, cannot roll my damn eyes hard enough. Why not say that then? You know what I'm saying? Like, this is what I'm talking about, where he's had this time to concoct this stuff. And a lot of the stuff, now he will say later, he's like, oh, Lacey knew about the boat. Lacey knew about the boat. She helped me pick it up. She went down to the shop to look at it. So again, with that, he's that's how you could be like, oh, that's how her hair ended up on the boat, intertwined in the fire. It's like, okay. You know, he, d he plants these little Easter eggs or whatever. Anyways, let's keep going. Scott says he didn't have concerns when he first got home as he assumed that she was at her mom, so he didn't worry. The cop says the first thing he did was dump the mop, mop bucket, wash his clothes, etc. had pizza, milk, shower, listen to voicemail. 
we already talked about this, but we'll hint on it again. You come home, you've been gone all day, you left her a message, she doesn't call back. You assume she's at her mom's so you don't worry. And this is where people like this telling themselves. Then why wouldn't you, knowing what's going on before you do the other stuff, call the mom real quick. Hey, is Lacey over there? Why wouldn't you do that? Why? Even if it wasn't a pregnant woman, why wouldn't you do that? You're all lovey-dovey and married and talk to each other's cute way, but yet you don't worry about that. And then you add the layer of, you know, it's your wife, she's pregnant, very pregnant, probably doesn't need to be out doing much, you know, but you have the time to do all this other stuff first. The math ain't math -in. Okay, let's keep going. Detective says Scott asked during the interview to get the family grief counselor, and he's like, oh, what? Now, the detective didn't say what, but those are my words. Scott says his mood was reported falsely. I, let's just keep going. I'm just going to come unglued. Okay, so a next door neighbor named Karen, I know it's kind of ironic, right? but her name's Karen. December 24th, she finds the Peterson's dog running around outside the gate with a leash on. She puts the dog back in the gate behind the house. They track a receipt from her receipt from a store and they're able to tell that a 1018 is a key time. Keep that in mind. This helps them eliminate people, but they can't eliminate Scott. Scott's sister-in-law, Jane, basically is like they assume because the dog was out on the leash that Lacey was already dead. The sister-in-law talks about how they all came together to get the word out with the media. Okay, well, hold on for a second. This time is going to become very pivotal. Very pivotal. Very, and their whole thing of she was still alive. The neighbor saw this at this time and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this will be major, 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 okay? So just keep that in mind. So Janie talked about, you know, they got together, they get the word out. They had like all this, I mean, instantaneously, it was bam, we're putting all our resources together. We're doing all this stuff for media and printing stuff. And they threw a lot of money at it and a lot of people and a lot of man out power and effort and whatnot. An attorney and Janie says all the focus went on Scott. This is normal. This is what happens. You work from the inside out. If you cannot move past the person on the inside, you know, you're going to keep circling back to them. Is it right, wrong, or indifferent? Well, if the evidence points to that person, I mean, what do you expect, right? So it is what it is. The filmmaker asked Scott about his behavior, how he acted weird and didn't cry. He says they say that because he was un something the first few weeks to go. He was, I'm sorry. He was unwilling the first few weeks to go on the camera and show off his terrible emotions. This is another thing here. Now, here's the thing. Think to all these situations. And again, this gets into this whole thing that society places on different, you know, their expectation of a man, their expectation of a woman, the mother, the father, the blah, 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 all this stuff, right? Typically in these scenarios, what you will see a lot of times is the man and the woman going up and the woman being a wreck and the man speaking, right? Let's say it's their kid or something like that, right? These situations, even Chris Watts got up there right? Swaying back and forth, you know, doing all this weird stuff. Susan Smith got up there crying and lying, crying and lying. Husband stood there trying to be the stoic whatever. For Scott to say he didn't want to show off his emotions, take attention away or do this. He has all this concocted stuff over it. You know, and some people might be like, oh, well, he's a guy, you know, they don't want to show that kind of whatever. When this kind of stuff happens and everyone is telling you, you need to be out there, you need to be making Lacey, uh, humanizing her in the media for the people who've abducted her, this, that, and the other, you get over stuff real quick, okay? Look at how it backfired for the McCann parents when they, uh, Madeline McCann, when they started, you know, we're not going to go in the media, we're like, we're kind of reeling everything in or whatever. And that's a whole other I know, that's a whole other thing right there. So him talking about like, oh, I just didn't want to show off my emotions and blah, blah, blah. No, I don't, absolutely not. You know, and the whole little card of, you know, I'm a tough guy doesn't, mm -mm, nope, sorry. Mm -mm, we're not using that card today. Okay, so sister-in-law says that Scott was basically like, I didn't do anything. And once everything settles, it'll be okay because I didn't do anything. Well, we see how that panned out. The detectives say they wanted to search his house again, but Scott's like, I'm not gonna sign this without a lawyer. And they're like, uh, yeah, so we already have a warrant and a, yeah, we're doing it anyways, buddy. That right there. And again, if you watch the other series with Lacey, they already went over this. Again, they come there. Oh, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll do this or that. I'll do this or that. And then they bring the paper. And then, oh, well, I talked to so-and-so and, you know, I should really have a lawyer here for that. If you're not 
hiding something and you potentially think that Lacey was abducted from your home or the vicinity, why in God's name wouldn't you be willing to just open your doors wide open? You know, let's say at minimum, you, you're sitting here talking about like, oh God, you know, got a bunch of weed in the back, you know. Officers, I just, I, I've got this, but search the house, whatever you gotta do. Here's the keys to my house. Do I need to vacate the damn place for you? That's normal. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's normal. This right here, not normal, <laughs> okay? So, there we go. Now, Jane says that Scott never denied access the day she went missing, but then two days later, they show up with a search warrant. Of course they're gonna show, they search the house multiple times. What are they gonna find with it? Y'all are talking about the LA Innocence Project is, oh, we have all this new evidence. That's how you get it. You don't get to pick and choose if it makes your person look bad. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what they're gonna do over and over and over and over and just keep doing this. And again, for the cops, this is why they can't move past Scott, because like, why wouldn't he let us come search the house? We can't move past him now because that's sus, as the kids would call it these days. Okay, so detective said nothing showed violent act taking place in the house. And that was the thing that, I mean, you have to admit this, there's not like no signs of this at all, right? Except for that little blood thing. Now one detective did say on the bed, it looked like an imprint of somebody who had been like laid there. I personally think that he strangled her. That's what I think. I think, and that's what they kind of allude to as well. Uh, we're kind of going on a little left-hand turn here. I think he strangled her. I think it was very quick. I think it was probably very personal. I pray she didn't know what was exactly going on, if that makes sense. Uh, because I can only imagine the panic she went through over that. But I think that's what he did. I think he killed her early morning and then kind of prepped everything. So we'll get into my thoughts about the dog walking and stuff like that later. Let's keep going. Okay, Scott Peterson talks about detectives having confirmation bias. Scott says that they came in the house not looking for Lacey, but looking for evidence against him. Well, they knew, I, I mean, I get what he's trying to say. They're looking for evidence. And of course, they're going to be looking in the context of we're trying to eliminate the spouse, but we can't eliminate the spouse because everything is pointing back towards him, not over here. This is before we get into the conversation about the burglary across the street. Okay, let's keep going. Detectives say after they search the house, they want to go to his warehouse. This is like where the boat is, the stuff for his fertilizer, all that stuff. They talk about the concrete anchors. They say it looks like five were made. Only one was technically found. Then Scott disputes that and says he didn't make five. There was needle nose pliers found with a hair intertwined in them and Lacey's hair couldn't be excluded from the possibility of it being hers. I mean, yeah, do the math on that. The detective says, yeah, maybe it comes off Scott's closing, but it was wrapped up in the pliers. So, I mean, this is, you know, concrete residue, was found in the boat that matches the theory of the homemade anger. So it sounds like how you would be doing something movement with the concrete in the boat was made them, you know, think that like there was evidence of these being in here. You could clearly see in the evidence photos, the round buckets on the ground, right? The, the, not the round buckets, but the, the silhouette or whatever you call it, like where they were. So yeah, that to me is just very obvious. Okay. Let's keep going. Then we get to Amber. They talk about the call from Amber. She says, you know, she's dating Scott. They rewind two months before Lacey disappears, October 2002. And they go into like Amber and how she met him in the whole nine yards. And she says, you know, we met through a friend. Uh, November, whirlwind romance starts between them. Detective meets with Amber. She agrees to wire up. They record all these phone calls. They got like 29 hours and some change of recorded phone calls with Scott, which would play into and work very well in the courtroom. They talk about his lies, obviously. And they go into the whole thing about how, you know, the timeline with him and Amber in the first night, I lost my wife. You know, this is the first time I lost her. And then as Amber starts calling him out on his lies, you know, and hear him saying, well, I meant a different kind of lost. And those are the kind of things that when you hear that, you're like, oh, any rational human being. And you can hear Amber saying, seriously, you know, real dude, like the fact that he kept lying about it is blows my mind, right? And again, we'll get to it, but these are played in the courtroom. And even though he didn't testify, this was very damning. When you hear someone lying to the degree and about the things that this man lied to on the phone with Amber and Cor, 
over the murder trial of his wife, you can say what you want to say. This is not going to bode well with the jury. Any, I don't care what situation it is. When you put a phone call of a man calling a woman up, talking about I'm in Paris, calling from a candlelight vigil of Lacey, that could have been the only damn phone call they had. And you know everyone had to be looking at him like, <laughs> okay, like here's the thing. There's people who cheat and like, oh, I cheated on my wife, I did this. That's a whole other like, you're doing what? This just shows zero, if you truly had your, if it was all a coincidence, right? And your person is stolen from you, you happen to be having this affair, I, I can't fathom that would even be in your mind. Take away the fact that he didn't think that she would turn on the TV, right? How did you think that she was never going to find this out? That blows my mind. Okay, let's keep going. So, okay, then the investigator says that he's lying about stuff and that he doesn't need to lie about. This is Aphrodite Jones. That's how pathological he is. Okay, if you've dealt with people like this, because I found myself saying this from like, they're lying about things they don't need to lie about. Like, do they think I'm that dumb and they enjoy doing it? You know what I'm saying? Like, if you, and again, I'm like, you know, my experience with these people, I'm like, why would you? lie about that for other than the sake of lying right and this is like dealing with just people in every day or work life personal life dating whatever where you're like there's there's no need to do that so why do it so then i mean you apply that to this in a murder case where it's like he's just lying about stuff it's like why Th there's no need okay let's keep going i'm getting marked up over this now the detective says he didn't want a divorce he didn't want to pay that money he didn't want child support he didn't want a child he wanted a new life they go again into the whole timeline he meets Amber November 20th. He buys the boat December 9th. I mean, this was boom, boom, boom. Okay. And this is one thought that keeps coming to my mind with this. You know, you want to talk about like, oh, there's no coincidences in a murder and there's no this or that. When you look at what the family is looking at, and I'm talking about like Janie and these people and whatnot, and I get, you know, I'm not trying to put them out there like that. It's their loved one. It's their family. I understand that. You know, but it's almost like, why is it okay for there to be coincidences over here? Oh, he was having an affair, but that doesn't mean anything. Yeah, but oh, the the burglary that means something yeah that that coincidence we can't that has to be connected well then why can't it be for the affair you see what i'm saying like two things can be possible at once right you can you could be cheating on your wife your husband whoever and then they get killed and you have nothing to do with it that can totally happen but also a three ring circus can be going on across the street with robberies and stuff while a husband's murdering his wife across the street and the two aren't connected. That can be a thing as well, right? I get it's bizarre and whatnot, but it's just, you have to be able to apply that logic to all scenarios. So anyways, let's keep going. Now the detective will go into kind of what I talked about earlier, where the detective says he most likely killed her December 24th morning, wrapped her up, went through all the motions, his plan, you know, get her to the truck, get her to the shop, get her to the boat, the whole nine yards. Scott says that's disgusting and so not true. He regrets cheating on her. He was childish. Lack of self-esteem. Amber made him feel good. Now he'll go into basically talking about like, and I might have made a note about this later, but we'll go ahead and talk about it now in case I forget. Where he's basically like, well, you know, Amber just, you know, made it more than it was, you know, and it was this or that. He's on the phone talking about spending a life with her. Now another thing too with this that comes to my mind is look at okay let's look at the alec murdoch trial for a minute in that case if you follow that okay so remember at a certain point where alec had to come clean about the fraud and he was very quick to be like i did that i'm a horrible person i stole this i ripped these people off i did this but i didn't kill maggie and paul it's almost like alec knew i'm gonna have to take the l on this thing over here to make myself look like i'm telling the truth here so you gotta believe me over here so scott knows enough here but again he doesn't do it like alec sold it a lot better what's it scott mm -mm, he's like look i know it's like i was childish i mean i was doing this granted it's been 20 years right so even if it was even if he wasn't lying or making it up it's still gonna be a little bit numb to this right but regardless he's trying to do the same thing where he's like yeah, I was, you know, it was really crappy. I was this, but again, I come out of this. I'm like, bro, this wasn't just cheating. Let's go on the assumption that he's truly innocent. I, I can't get back. You're calling Amber from the candlelight vigil for Lacey, planning a life with the woman talking about I'm embarrassed. I, I 
I can't with that, okay? It literally just pisses me off so bad. I should have get this upset, but now I gotta go work here a little bit. This is why I wanted to do, literally y'all, this is why I was like, I have to come talk about this before I go to work, because it is. that's all I'm gonna talk about at work. I pray that some of my coworkers have watched this. Oh my God, I cannot wait. Okay, anyways, so here we go. So the filmmaker asked Scott why he kept talking to Amber even after Lacey disappeared. He says he wanted the search to continue and to stay in contact with her after her and basically like her being in the picture would complicate the search he said he didn't want it to stop and if amber was found out that would switch the narrative to that okay on that right there i mean it's a logical question i'll give the filmmaker that why god's name even after she, you know he finds all this stuff out he's still talking to her and i'm like seriously like after it was like all exposed you know i get what he's saying but no absolutely not not buying that one little bit. Okay, so Janie, the sister-in-law, says that she was disappointed and she was shocked and mad at him, you know, find out he cheated and public perception totally changed. Now, they have explained this away, right? Now, at one point, too, she'll talk, like, one of them will talk about, like, I wouldn't even call it an affair. And you're just kind of like, I mean, what, a, what, what would you call it? I mean, it wasn't hooking up, okay? Like... This is a little bit more than that, right? A hookup doesn't look like Christmas photos and Christmas parties and leaving your, you know, pregnant wife at home for her Christmas or your her friend's Christmas party while you're with Amber. No, okay. Anyways, let's keep going. So Janie says that her family hired a private private investigator. Janie and an attorney circle back to that 1018 time and say, is anyone in the neighborhood have seen Lacey after 1018, then Scott's innocent. So basically that's what they're saying. This whole timeline of, you know, okay, well this happened at 1018, so we know the receipt, we know the dog. So if somebody saw her after that, then we know that Scott's innocent, right? It wasn't him because he left the house at whatever it was, you know, whatever time this was, 1008 or whatever. They interview this couple, the Mall Donatos, uh, I hope I'm saying their name right. Uh, they're interviewed, they're out delivering presents, they get gas. They say they see a very beautiful pregnant woman walking a golden retriever. And he commented to his wife about it and said, I hope she doesn't fall. And that was that, but it was enough to stick out. Frank Aguilar was driving Christmas Eve between 10 to 11. And he saw her walking her golden retriever to the park. So now we're on this whole narrative and theory of Lacey walking the dogs and potentially running into the burglary next door. Okay, another neighbor was standing at a window washing dishes and she sees a woman walking a golden retriever. Another woman at 1045 saw a woman walking a golden retriever. Several people say the police never questioned them about what they saw. Scott says so many credible witnesses saw her walking the dog. Scott says police told one person they were wrong and didn't see Lacey. Okay, here's my thing. When I listen to this part, and this is one of the things where I was like, I can start to appreciate how the family members would go down this rabbit hole of, all these people are claiming they see this very pretty pregnant woman walking a golden retriever to this park in the neighborhood. I mean, do the math on that, right? You know, but it's like, well, Lacey wasn't supposed to be, things don't really add up with it, right? She was very pregnant. She wasn't supposed to be doing that. So why would she be walking the dog? It made me wonder if Scott put some kind of like outfit on and dressed up as a pregnant woman, you know, that kind of a thing. So one of the cops, and I'll talk about this a little bit later too, but I'll go ahead and say it in case I forget to, you know, he'll say, look, a lot of times eyewitness testimony is the least reliable. And he's like, you know what? People want to help. They want to be beneficial. They get times mixed up. They get, they, they want to see something that might have, they might have seen a pregnant woman, but do we know it was Lacey? Do we know it was Golden Retriever? That type of thing, right? So this is where that gets very kind of murky. Okay, so episode two, The People versus Scott Peterson. Filmmakers ask Scott how he feels after the world decided he was guilty once they heard the phone calls with Amber. Okay, they do ask the hard hitting questions in this. This is what he says. He says that he felt horrible. Then she, I mean, like the interviewer, asked, why didn't you tell police about Amber. He says during the so-called investigation, he did all he could do to bring the family home. <laughs> just, just go past that for now, okay? And he didn't tell people why, he didn't tell people because he wanted the search to continue. He says that he can see why Amber tried to turn it into a relationship after the fact and make it something more than it was, but he says it wasn't, and he was wrong, and he says it's devastating, and he feels guilty over it. Okay, so let's just go back to the comment of I did all I could do to bring the family home. 
I mean, you're like throwing up roadblocks to the police, right? And again, you can get into the argument, which is understandable, but everything is very unique. All these cases that we watch are like fingerprints. They're very unique. All the circumstances are very similar. Or I'm sorry, very you know unique to its own set of circumstances. And so what I mean by that is, you know, for one case, somebody might be like, no, look, I need to, I don't want to sign that. I don't care what you think. Like I'm being railroaded, but, 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 and it might make sense, right? In this particular case, for me and my personal opinion, like when they're coming, hey, we need to do another search. We need to do this. And he's going roadblocks. It's like, well, why? You know, well, why? Even if you think, oh, well, they think that I did this to Amber, whatever. We're trying to get rid of you as the person, but we can't. You know what I'm saying? It's like we keep coming back to it. There's nothing pointing anywhere else. I know that his family will argue about the whole thing going across the street with the, the burglars and the van and all that, but that wasn't like this was not all happening. We don't, we're able to look back on this case now with a full picture of it. Whereas before it was like happening piece by piece. And a lot of this stuff wasn't coming out at that time. So to say, well, I did all I could do to bring the family back. Well, no, you didn't. You were calling Amber from the candlelight vigil saying you're in Paris. I mean, come on, right? Okay, now also in that where he then is like, oh, well, I see, you know, why she wanted to make it more than it was. Maybe it was a hookup. Basically, the way I interpret what Scott was saying in that is that she was just a hookup. She was just a piece of you know what. And so he's like, what well, would only look better for, you know, her to make it out like it was going to be a relationship, this and the other. If you listen to the phone calls and not even all 30 hours of them, that that's, I don't know what kind of hookup culture he was living in. That's not hookup talk that they were having. You know what I'm saying? You're not having those conversations with someone who you're just hooking up with. It doesn't even make sense. I can't even believe that he honestly said that because unless he's also admitting, well, I was lying to her too. I was just telling her what she needed to know because honestly, again, Thank God it stopped at Lacey and Connor didn't go further because I can guarantee you, in my opinion, if he had gotten away with Lacey and Connor and like say he got up with Amber, oh, especially by now, 20 years later, y'all, we would have already heard the headlines with Amber. She would be gone too, possibly her daughter. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just seem, it feels like it's just his M.O. So to, for him to sit here and try and talk about, oh, it's just a hookup, whatever, mm -mm, nope, not buying it. Okay, let's let's keep going. So, okay, so then we hear from somebody else in the, docu the documentary. He says, you know, did they learn about the witnesses seeing Lacey? We learn about the burglar across the street. And everybody's kind of like, this is the big break, right? This is what's going to tie it all together. So Diane Jackson, a neighbor, saw the robbery taking place with the men in the van, but wasn't sure of what she was seeing in that moment so she basically just keeps going so they're looking for three men in a van very soon two suspects are found they are very cooperative they take polygraphs they pass them they want the results released to the public so that the people in jail will know they didn't kill Lacey now let's pause there for a second so a few things that will go on in here is basically the circumstances and talking about there being two sets of robbers it sounds like one which was an initial like three dudes and a van and then these two dudes or whatever and a theory we're going to get to it in a minute but i'll go ahead and talk briefly about it a theory that's presented is that it's like there's almost like this you know and this does happen i mean for sure where it's almost like you know and i don't know what you call it, like an organized crime type thing right where a group of people are targeting houses and whatnot and so there could be multiple people in on it and so it's almost like this whole thing of like with well, the first three men that were seen there are the ones that she encountered and that took her these two dudes Either they were took the fall or who knows, right? But if you go according to what, like, just, like, basically what the cops are saying, all that, these two dudes, and what the two dudes say, they robbed the house. They start learning that, oh, my God, somebody across the street was murdered. Okay, please polygraph us. We know we're getting popped for the, we know we're going to jail. Please polygraph us. Please put it out in the public because they know they're, they're like career criminals, if you will, right? They've kind of been in and out. It sounds like this is drug money type thing, whatever. What I'm getting at is they kind of know the system and everything. They are not dumb, okay? Anybody going to jail slash prison, I mean, they're going to jail first, obviously, but regardless, anyone rolling up in there with a stigma over their head that they possibly killed a pregnant woman and her unborn child, you already know, okay? You already know what's gonna happen to them, okay? So of course, they're like, poly, it gives me goosebumps, so I polygraph us, 
release it to the public. We can't have anyone up in this jail thinking about, we did that, okay? Which is, side note, blows my mind that Scott Peterson wanted to do anything that would get him put in gym pop, and I'm talking about getting reduced from death penalty down to you know, life without parole, he's in general population. I'm sure they have him segregated. The fact that the man has lived 20 some years, even on death row, probably segregated and stuff, no one's got to him, shocks me. Really shock. I, I don't know how he's done it. Same with Chris Watts on that note, right? How this lot, how? We already know the things that are coming out recently that we've heard. So this dynamic here of like them saying, hey, look, you know, we didn't do it, we want to prove that. I, I get that and that to me checks out. Okay, so Scott's family and a private investigator come up with a slew of people involved in the theft. The neighborhood, the neighbor can't even confirm the color of the van. The burglar says they robbed the house on the 26th. Scott's family says there's so much activity on the 26th. How do they get past everyone? Scott says that the cops ignored the evidence and chose to and chose to ignore it. So here's the thing: when the when the burglars come forth and they're talking about what we did on this day, and it's like, well, first of all, the first date didn't check out, so it, you know the, his family's name was like, so they just change it. They know that the burglary took place basically between point A and point B, right? And the burglars would say at one point, yeah, we saw a bunch of media and stuff like that. Now, and I do agree with this part where I'm like. This is like, uh, like right there. Like, how would you rob the place with all this going on or whatever, right? So the theory of, and we'll get into this more a little bit in episode three, but the theory of Lacey confronting them and them kidnapping her all that. I don't personally know Lacey, obviously. So I really can't, I mean, it's literally just an opinion, but I guess in my world, you know, and it's kind of like this, it's like, okay, she went and walked the dog, she saw this robbery taking place, and she confronts him and they kidnap her and they take her off in this van, they do something to her, and then they burn the van for evidence, right? That's what they're basically trying to say. And that, um, 100% could seem plausible, right? But then when I start to peel it away, and again, I just come back down to this where I'm like, I just, you know, again, but I don't know her. Would a very, very pregnant woman who's not even supposed to, you know, be, really be moving around too much, walk her dog, and then in that confront three strange men or two strange men that, you know, is something's going on to the extent that she needs to feel like she say, what are you doing? Would that really take place? You know, I really question that, right? And I'm not trying to say it's impossible, but I question it. Now, also the whole thing with neighbors and stuff like that, and you'll hear from, whether I talked about it earlier, we'll get to an episode three where the detective's like, and you know, look, when you talk about eyewitnesses, they're very unreliable. They want to help. It's like good intentions, but they get things wrong. They think they saw this, you know, the the, the confirmation bias, all these things that play into it. And so that's kind of what I think a lot of is going on with some of the eyewitness stuff where I'm like, they know this is, they know a pregnant woman, so then people start to see any, you know, it becomes obvious to you. You know how like if you're shopping for a car, and I want to get a brand new truck. Well, you start noticing like, wow, everybody's driving this truck because it's in your perception. And I don't know what that's called, right? But I feel like that's something that went on here. But we'll get into it more as we go. So let's just keep going. Okay, so now they get to the Amber Fry press conference. Amber becomes the focus, changes everything. And the support for Scott from Lacey's family changes. They wonder what else he's lying about. Now again, we saw this in the other docu-series. If you were, you know, we lived through it, some of us. This changes everything. She comes forth. She puts everything out. The man still tried to talk to her. That's the part that I'm like, what? Like, the, it, it doesn't make sense. But then you're going to try and say it was a hookup. Why would you keep talking to the hookup who just put you on front street? Literally just changed the course of the whole thing for you. Now, people wanted to come for Amber at first, right? Not everyone, but like it took people the public a minute or whatever because she was, you know, pivoted as the mistress, the this, the that, and the tabloid. This was, I mean, y'all, tabloid fodder. National Enquirer should literally be paying this woman, okay? And Michael Jackson. I mean, it was like that level, okay, of tabloid. That's all. And it was scandal. It, I mean, I, I mean, 
absolute scandal. Just think of this day and age where if the only outlet we had for stuff for the Chris Watts and um, that whole situation was National Enquirer instead of like YouTube and the, you know, the whatever we have now. That's, you know, with the NK and Chris Watts thing. That like literally, okay? It was that insane. So this completely changes the course of everything. His family is like, or her family is and Lacey's family is like, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, no sir. Okay, so after the Amber interview, the only then does Scott decide to do an interview and he speaks to Diane Sawyer and he tells her he told Lacey about the affair with Amber and even Diane's like what you expect me the public anyone whatever to believe that you told Lacey your wife eight months about to give birth to y'all's son that you're having an affair and she was cool she's cool with that <laughs> I'm sitting here the whole time I'm watching I'm like Scott you do know like even like regardless of like whatever like it doesn't sound right but I'm like you're telling this to Diane a woman who she can probably relate a lot more to how Lacey would interpret these feelings and whatnot you know than another dude it's almost like I'm like dude this isn't locker room talk right like well, you know I told her she's cool with it you know I'm like no you think how do you think that went over with the people sitting at home not good, okay? For obvious reasons. It's like Michael Peterson for the staircase. You know, when he's talking about, no, no, Kathleen knew. She knew I was um, out sleeping with dudes. You know, she was cool with it. That, that was our relationship. This is, I just thought of this. Scott Peterson, Michael Peterson, they're both saying the same thing. You no, know, you don't know. That's our relationship. Last name Peterson, when they start talking about, I told her, fill in the blank, and you don't know it's our relationship, major red flags, major red flags. So this does not go well, okay? Makes him look really, really bad. So Scott says the interviews are edited. And whenever I come back and just to clarify, I just wanna say Scott says, this is like current times, they're, they're switching back and forth, okay? Scott says that the interviews are edited. They make things look a certain way. Scott says people spit on him at gas stations. He got death threats, all sorts of things. I wonder why, right? I mean, can you imagine? He was free for so long. I mean, not so, so long, but you know what I'm saying? Like, enough, right? And people are watching this, like, unfold. Every day it just becomes more and more insane. I wouldn't have left the house. I would literally not love that way he was trying to, well, whatever. we'll get to that in a second about him trying to flee. Anyways, let's keep going. Okay, so there is a water search around Berkeley Marina. They talk about a couple of anchors found, but they weren't connected. They weren't really looked into. Then Lacey's body washes ashore, Point Isabel, and an infant body is recovered as well. Can you only imagine, gives me goosebumps, the rescue workers, the people who are finding this. And then to point, you know, to dot it all together of this is what we were, this is Lacey. This is this case. This is the baby. I mean, oh my, it gives me goosebumps, y'all. I can't imagine. But that's often what we see with these crimes of this level. You know, when people are taking the lives of other people and whatnot and in heinous ways and just, you know, barbaric ways, to be quite honest. There's the obvious victims in this Lacey, Connor, Lacey's parents, but then even Scott's family, Lacey's family, the um the workers who found them, you know, the rescue workers, all this stuff. The the line of victimhood or whatever you call it, victimization, is is deep, right? Okay, so Scott says at first he didn't believe it was Lacey and Connor. They start watching him heavily, but the DNA confirms this. Scott starts moving early in the day, cops are following him through wiretap. And what they're talking about in this part is and again if you watch the other docuseries or if you followed it, you know, once at a certain point they're number one, they got him wiretap, they got his truck wire tap his phone was truck somebody else had it or something like that so they're following him around in the capacity of phone calls and he's supposed to be going meeting his brother and then to play golf but he's talking about i'm being followed by the the media the paparazzi not the paparazzi but you know same kind of vibe so he's going to call it off well the cops are talking about he was very good at evasively driving and we were nervous he was going to get in a wreck and harm somebody so we had to make the decision to be like let's go ahead and get him let's pull him over okay so then it says 
filmmaker questioned Scott about the day of the arrest. He says when his family had rough times, they always did something together. He says that that day he was going to go play golf with his dad and brothers, but he gets followed by who he thinks is the media, but it's cops. He's driving crazy. They decide to arrest him. They said he questioned, he, okay, so this is what the cops said. He didn't question them. He had dyed his hair. He grew a goatee. He had a cell phone. He had 10 grand in cash. He had, you know, shovels, his brother's driver's license. Everything that made it look like this dude is going incognito and getting ready to flee. Now, he was also like 30 miles from the border visiting family, his family will say and whatnot. So it's just a coincidence. You do the math on that. I do buy the fact that if I were him, I would have changed my parents a little bit just to be able to go out in public but I would have probably been wearing like hats and glasses and stuff like that but all the stuff in his car and whatnot I mean you were trying to tell me that this is normal stuff and again well it's like well look he was being framed so he had a flea okay sure Jan okay let's keep going Scott says he was not fleeing to Mexico. He was not running from cops. He said he dyed his hair over death threats. He took his brother's ID to get a discount at the golf place. And this all might be true, right? But again, there's too many other things going on besides that. Now, Janie talks about being in shock when he was arrested. Remember, this is the sister-in-law. Janie says San Diego borders Mexico, and there's lots of their family there. And that is why he was there. He was not running to Mexico. Investigators say after his arrest, they drive back to Modesto. He gets the news that it's Lacey and Connor, and he has little to no reaction. And in fact, he goes through, I think, Burger King, and he eats this huge meal, and just kind of like acting like, hmm. You know, and of course, now he's more like, oh, well, I didn't believe it was really them, and you know, this and the other. Again, he's had 20 years to come up with excuses for every little thing that happened, right? A normal person would... Number one, question why they're getting arrested. Number two, when they got confirmation of, it's my wife and son, probably have a little bit of a reaction. Just Sam, you know. So there's that, let's keep going. Okay, so then Scott says, you know, like I said, he didn't think it was them. He didn't believe the cops and they told him. So of course, that's why he was acting, you know, nonchalant. Janie says the fight to find Lacey then became a fight for Scott's life. Now, they talk about this whole thing that they basically brought this person in to do a pretend cross-examination. And the dude said that they did that. He cannot speak to what was said or anything like that. But after that, the decision was made for him not to testify. <laughs> You can only imagine what this guy knows. And that's the whole thing, like, with the general public and stuff like that, there's people like that that know stuff, that have seen stuff that are inside the case. You know, other jurors, people like that, that the general public hasn't seen, that they, they know, right? Someone like me, like, I don't know everything, right? I would love to know what this guy discovered in the pretend cross-examination. And he's probably like, yeah, the, the jury's going to, tear this guy to pieces. He has no alibi. He keeps mixing his story up. He's lied left and right to everybody. You know, it is what it is. So then we hear from a juror and they say the defense was good. And that actually the state did not seem, you know, as well sided as well versed or anything like that. Like the defense, he had a good defense team. The best of money. I mean, y'all, this is like a major lawyer attached to this case. And they come out fighting, right? I mean, the first day, I think, they show that the, the prosecution was wrong about something. You know, they proved about the thing that was mar that we were watching TV that morning, where the state's like, that that wasn't true. And they're like, well, yeah, here's the video of it. I mean, he had a good defense team, okay? And I think if I remember correctly, whether it was this one or the other series on Lacey, where one of the jurors basically was like, yeah, those uh, phone calls did it for us. Like, had there not been those phone calls like, between Scott and Amber, he might have walked, right? He might have walked. Let's keep going. So Scott said that Lacey did know about the boat, that she helped him shop for it, and went to the shop to look at it. They talk about how amazing Scott's defense attorney was. But when Amber Fry takes a stand, this is when they play all the tapes of Scott's phone calls. Burglary isn't admitted into evidence. The jury never hears about that. Scott says he regrets rushing through. So Scott's basically like, I regret kind of doing the trial fast. The, yeah, they're, his family him were very upset that nothing of the robbery was ever brought in. You do have to wonder if that would have changed the course of the conviction. Um, but I believe the evidence that they would have presented at that time, could it be reasonable doubt? Sure. Could it also be like, you know, the whole thing of like, you have a three ring circus going on across the street, but there's enough going on here to show that the two didn't, this was Scott over here. A lot of coincidences going on. So this robbery takes place, Scott happens to go out 
and take a boat out under really weird circumstances. Says he's going to be fishing, but has the wrong kind of fishing pole. Doesn't open the lures. And that's when Lacey disappears. And it reappears in the same lot. I mean, come on, right? Okay, so let's jump to episode three, okay? Appeals and lingering questions, right? So, you know, Scott, yes, he is found guilty. He's sentenced to the death penalty. They, again, it doesn't show much emotion to any of this. Just kind of like whatever. Now, Scott says that he strived to show no emotion because he was so angry at the media. And even some of the media, like, that, I can't think of his name right now, he's from Court TV. He's in this and he's talking, and a lot of people talk about the media. And how, I mean, this was so huge. It was like, how did it not affect the trial, right? We see this all the time with these major, 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 major trials. Sarah Boone would like you to think that she has a... Let's put it this way. Okay, if you're following all the cases we're going on right now, Sarah Boone would like you to think that her trial, her case, is that, that of Scott Peterson. It doesn't even come close, right? And you see how much attention that's getting, but it's still very... There's plenty of people who are like, Sarah who? You, you could go up to 10 random strangers when you left your house and say Scott Peterson, and they immediately knew who you were talking about and could talk about the case. Okay, so just kind of use that as a like perspective. It's like O.J. Simpson, okay? It was literally up that level. We're talking, the, the Lacey Peterson situation, we're talking this up there in OJ, Jean Benet, Madeline McCann. I mean, that level of everyone knows about it, right? Okay, let's keep going. Casey Anthony, all those, okay. So, Janie's sister-in-law says that she ends up going to law school, uh, which, get, getting her law degree, she says she didn't do it because of Scott, but basically she was so immersed in it. It was something that she ended up doing, and it has given her a much better understanding of the issues with the case. They talk about media bias. Then a private investigator and Janie talk about the burglars and the inconsistencies. They believe Lacey encountered the theft on the 24th, and that it was a different set of men than the ones who came forward, and that she was a victim of the three men. Scott says he believes Lacey confirmed of the three men and was taken so he has run with this theory right again all very coincidental just happens to be the day that he leaves happens to be the day that he has this secret boat that sure Lacey know about it wink wink she also know about amber wink wink so there's that okay so the defense team says he's not capable of this this is obviously his uh and says they felt like the evidence backed his innocence they think even more exonerating evidence exists there are discrepancies about the van Another van is found burned up, but it, at the time was ruled out. P.I. starts going through everything and goes to interview the owner of the van, who it was stolen from. He learns that employees can take cars home for the weekend, so he deducts that they burned the van to cover a crime. It's found near a home, and it's like this relation of somehow, like, you know, the six degrees of separation, it's like very close to those two dudes who came forward, one of the two dudes that came forward, you know, about the burglary or whatever. So, yeah, basically with the van, they're saying, okay, look, we went, we interviewed the person and apparently like however the situation was with the van employees could take cars home and whatnot so they're like if a crime why what would be the reasoning to destroy the van other than to hide a crime if you're allowed to basically take the car you know that kind of thing so and you do have to question well like, yeah what were they trying to hide now again we'll get into the talk about what was found in the van so a fire investigator speaks about the van situation, talks about the mattress found in the back of the van, the van. An area of the mattress is intact from basically where the gas can was set. It has blood on it. He says when deeper testing of the blood was done, there was no blood found. So basically they do a field test and it tests positive for blood, but then when they send it off, it comes back saying this isn't blood. You know, so that to me, I was like, oh, well, okay. Like, you know, where are we at with that? Scott says he wants DNA testing done and more discovery. Shireen and Jay, Shireen's the filmmaker, and Jane, sister-in-law, meet up to go over the evidence. New evidence from the mail delivery suggested that Lacey was in the home and the, when the dog was out on the leash and put back in the gate. So they basically find this documentation of like mail or delivery or something like that. And... This then deduces them to say, no, Lacey was still alive and was still home when the dog was found on the street by the neighbor and put back in there in the gate. So which brings up a whole bunch of other questions. Because again, Scott was gone at that point. So 
we'll get we'll get into some overall thoughts about it in a second. Let's just keep going for now. So we did that. The filmmaker follows up on a tip from a man who saw a pregnant woman in a van who it seemed sketchy. So this was one dude who was like, you yeah, and my wife were driving. I saw this van and the, this pregnant woman, like these guys let her out and she had to use the bathroom and they rushed her back in. She was really pretty and I yeah, made mention, but my wife was like, don't get involved in that. Now this wasn't, you know, this was like a kind of a di different area or whatever. But this to me, when I heard it, I was like, okay, but you know, are we just aware and heightened because everybody knows being on the lookout for a pregnant woman? Did that sound like it could be another situation? Sure. But you know, does that mean that it was Lacey? You know, one thing that you see with these cases, and I get it, it's what it is, but once the this process happens and they go through and they pick every last little bit apart to try and be like, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? You know, and that's what these lawyers are for, right? And it does help to prevent injustices from happening. But I mean, just a lot of this, I feel like is that it's just scraping over evidence. And I'm like, you're searching for something that's not going to be there. Okay, let's keep going. Scott says that so much evidence that didn't fit their narrative basically was overlooked because their narrative was he was guilty. And so if evidence didn't align with that, they just looked past it. A correction officer. Now this is another example of this. So then there's this whole thing about this correction officer that got some intel on the inmate phones, like basically those recorded phone calls. And that there was something about, you know, the word in the streets, Lacey, you know, was interrupting this theft and whatever. Well, the detective says that even though the recording of this was gone, once this, this correction officer was pressed, he recanted the story but they talked to the correction officer and he's like no I never recanted it but he's like essentially the way I interpreted it was he was like you yeah, know but it kind of turned out that it was more like you know third party information so I'm like oh so this was more he said she said and I'm like I'm sure there was tons of talk on those phones constantly about that. Do you know how many people would have loved to have had information to use as a bargaining chip to get out of jail or prison, whatever? You know, and even that, because when they started talking about my first thing, I was like, what if this is just intercepted? And like, yeah, we well, you know, I heard that there's talk on the street that, you know, this, that, and the other, because so many rumors flew around with this. I said, this is another example where like, yeah, but we need that info. This could be that. And I'm like, but it wasn't, right? And I get that they're trying to say, well, we need this. Okay, sure, great, here it is. But guess what? It didn't change anything. You know what I mean? It was a, as everybody says, a nothing burger. And that's just how I felt over that. So let's keep going. There was drama over a watch being pawned that Lacey had. And one was pawned, it was the same type of watch, whatever. It's kind of very distinct type, type thing. Again, it may or may not have been Lacey's. They don't know, but basically the attorney's are like, this is info that should have been shared. And I can respect that. Now it goes back to present day. They talk about his resentencing of to life without parole. Yes, again, shot. I mean, of course you're gonna to wanna to do that, but I would be like, no, please leave me locked up somewhere. The judge didn't ask questions to juror, and this is why. The judge did not ask questions to jurors who said that they were against the death penalty you're supposed to. Okay, so that was that. That's what happened. He didn't do a procedural technicality thing, so he gets it downgraded. But by downgrading, he loses his right to state-sponsored representation. His appellant attorney does all this research, and they go and reach out to the LA Innocence Project. They have asked for numerous items to be DNA tested, including things from the burned van. Now remember, as I said earlier, this is not the Innocence Project. This is the LA Innocence Project. So this is a very different thing. So then the investigator, he says, yes, we interviewed anyone who says they saw Lacey, but witness testimony isn't reliable like that. No one saw the confrontation. This is an excellent point. No one saw the confrontation. No one saw the abduction, but they saw all this other stuff happening. So... That part for me was uh, like absolutely sealed this because I'm like, yes, this is such a good point. Everyone's, we saw her walking the dog and we saw her doing this and we saw her doing that. Well, then where was the confrontation? If everybody saw all this stuff, why didn't anybody see the confrontation? Why didn't anybody see her being abducted? You know, the, if this is just all this stuff was going on because it probably didn't happen, right? Very well could have been another, you know, what if it was just a heavy woman walking a dog? You know, you just, you don't know. Nobody can confirm. Nobody can be like, no, that was Lacey. We stopped and talked. You know, nobody can say this, right? Okay, so when items are recovered from the burglary, nothing belonged to Lacey, which would be, again, weird. So then they talk about more of this whole thing of like, if it was these robbers or whatever, and the investigator's like, look, if they were gonna try and frame Scott for this, they would want that body found, right? They, you know, 
they didn't have a truck, they didn't have a boat. The detective says, you know, yeah, go absolutely test this evidence. It's not going to prove anything. And that's where I stand with it too. I'm like, let LA Innocence Project test all this stuff. Let them do it. It's going to sit here. It's not going to, I don't think it'll prove anything. I think what it'll prove is that he's guilty, right? A hundred percent. So now that here's the thing though, the judge denies most of the DNA testing around the van and only allows testing on the duct tape to be found on Lacey. So again, if they can find DNA on that duct tape that's from someone else besides Scott, now we're talking. Now we're talking. God help them if they find Scott's, which they could easily say, well, it came from Lacey's house or whatever, but you know, I mean, come on, right? So the filmmaker's like, you know, Scott, do you remember like what life was like 20 years ago? Ba 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 ba. And he goes in this holy mouth, I can still smell this. I can still remember this. And he says he left that day behind. His life has obviously changed. And then he tries to muster up these little tears. And that's all that I have there. So let's talk about it. You know, I know I've talked about it throughout, but let's just kind of close out with some thoughts. What you know, number one, Scott even the fake tears, he still can't even muster up tears over it. Now, mind you, it's been decades, but nonetheless, it feels like he's trying to muster up tears. That, like I said a second ago, when the detective was like, look, here's the thing. We interviewed all these people. We did all this type of stuff. Yes, we made mistakes here. We made mistakes there. No one saw the confrontation between Lacey and the, Nave and the burglars. No one saw this. No one saw that. Their alibis checked out. You know, yes, this is a circumstantial case, but there's so much of it that it's like, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a dog, you know, kind of a thing. Now I get at the end of the day, some of these cases, it's like, you're just never gonna know what happened. Like I said earlier in the video, Michael Peterson will never know what happened to Kathleen. Uh, Kaylee Anthony will never truly know what happened during that moment. Lacey Peterson, we're never gonna really know what happened, but we have to make deductions. Shanann Watts. We, I mean, that we have a little bit better idea, but you know what I'm saying? Nonetheless, if you, you know, you have to believe what Chris says, you get where I'm going with this. Um, yes, now with this particular case, this is way more like, we don't have a crime scene. We don't have a cause of death. We don't have this. We don't have that. It's way more like that. But again, when you start reading between the lines and you start looking at all the evidence, and I get the whole dynamic of just because you're a cheater doesn't mean you're a murderer, but in this particular instance in context, I'm like, yeah, but I feel like this one means something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many other things that align with, like, the, no. I ache for her family and obviously for Lacey and obviously for Connor. I don't really know what even to say or think about Scott's family, the defense, all that. One thing you have to also understand, like one thing that goes through my mind, like listening to the private investigator and stuff is I'm like, people make money off this. You know, and sadly, and I'm not trying to say that his family's doing that, but like people who are attached to the private investigator, I'm like, well, how much money are you getting? Or is this free that you're doing this? You know, because at a certain point, it only stands that, you know, there's a narrative to be had of he's innocent because it can make people money. You know what I mean? I also understand on someone like, say, Janie and his family and whatnot, I mean, yes, my initial thought is I'm like, oh, whoa, like, how do we not see this? You know, I often wonder too with Janie, I was like, does she have like a crush on him or, you know, something, but also that's family, you know, it is what it is. No one really knows what it's going to be like unless like, and I'm talking about from that dynamic of a loved one of yours does a heinous crime that where you have to accept that and essentially lose them to a certain degree. There just felt like a lot of denial on his family's part about a lot of things, not just the murder, but like the affair, the this. So many things that came forth that you're just like, you know, I mean, come on, right? So, you know, I don't think, my whole thing is, I don't think they'll ever be able to prove that it was the burglars. I don't think any other evidence will ever point towards anywhere else but Scott. And I think they can sit here and pick this apart their whole life and go over all that. You're still going to arrive at the same thing. I think the right person is in prison for it. Um, and I just, I think that he's right where he belongs, you know, and that is what it is. It will go on forever. Okay. You look at these cases. I can't think of his name right now, the army guy in Fort Bragg. I mean, they, they're still having hearings over that. So these things go on forever. So that's it. Let me know what you think down in the comment section. Thank you for watching. Drop some little subs off there for me and, well, Roscoe and Spirit. So we can hang out, talk about this and all the other cases. And until we do, 
I'll see y'all soon. I just wanted to say thank you again for watching the whole video and also thank you for being part of the Sofa Squad. Special thanks to all the Patreon members, channel members from both of my channels, everybody who likes, shares, subscribes, comments in the comment sections. It helps the channel out so much. Now don't forget, I do have that other channel, the podcast channel. That's where we go live, we hang out, we talk. Uh, we have kind of sort of a schedule, but just be sure and check it out. I'll put it up here on the screen. Also, if you're looking for merch, be sure to check out my Teespring store. I'll put that up here and then like i said in the beginning of the video if you want to follow me and roscoe on the instant on the gram on instagram go on check it out it's right here on the screen again but once again thank you very much i really appreciate you being part of the sofa squad and i'll see you in the next video